So thank you. I wanted to welcome you all here, uh, and especially those who may be live streaming, viewing us on the live stream, to the session two of the Digital Plus performance convening at the Festival of Live Digital Art, full da, or full day, if you will, full da, if you like better, which is what I like. Um, for those of us who are just joining us, we are inside the lobby of the Isabel Bader Performing Arts Center, which is located on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples in what is now known as Kingston, Ontario, Canada. So this session is about, is about the use of mixed reality work in live performance. And we are talking about that today with some colleagues um, who are joining us via Zoom from the Prague Quadrennial, and you can see those folks here on our screen today. I'm going There's to, and we can hear you. Do you want to say something? This is the traditional greeting when using Zoom, which is like, can you hear me? <laughs> uh, I just want to say that it's not just three of us sitting here. We are in a room, and what do you mind handing around? So we've got a small gathering of people here as well. When you properly pass us, I will explain the, the, the state of our room. Well, I, I'm happy to, to properly pass it over to you, Ian Garrett, who is our lead contact here to, um, and our collaborator with Toaster Lab. Ian, tell us about where you are right now, what's going on. Uh, so we're at the Prague Quadrennial, which uh, happens every four years in Prague. Uh, we are within a project called the Light Spot, uh, which is a series of conversations around uh, technology used uh, for stage design. Uh, it started as a lighting primarily project, but we've been integrating more media into it. Light Spot is contained within 360 or 36Q or 360Q, depending on who you ask, uh, which is a large project that's taken over a hockey arena, which maybe if we can go wild a little bit later, we can show you a little bit of that space. It has a number of immersive projects in it, uh, designed for a sound, VR, lighting, etc. Me describing it while you're looking at the, the walls in this room are not necessary, are not gonna do it justice. Uh, as it's a former hockey arena, the room that we're in right now uh, is a changing room that has been repurposed for this series of conversations that we've been having. Nearly a full conference uh, dedicated to both these conversations and then the ones from a North American cluster at the PQ. Uh, the Prague Quadrennial uh, celebrates uh, uh, performance design in space. Every four years, there's about 70 participating countries uh, that showcase both professional emerging work and an exhibition and then a number of out programs uh, that look at various ways of approaching sonography and performance design. And there's a huge media component about it that's added uh, this time. So, yes, we also have no AC. <laughs> uh, the AC went out in our building, so there's a little bit of fan noise in the background too, but that's how Prague works. 35 degrees outside. I'm sorry about the AC. Um, we just wanted to connect with you. It was very <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, we're kind of having, I don't know about anyone else in the room, but I feel like we're having the opposite problem where I'm feeling actually a little over AC'd, but we'll, we won't dwell on that. Um, I want to talk about our objective for this session, which is to share experiences, discuss challenges, and imagine what might be possible when it comes to integrating mixed reality into live performance. And so our time today has three sections. Uh, first, we're going to kick off the spirit of conversation that we want to cultivate, which is one that ex embraces experimentation and the inherent risks of experimentation. And we're going to share with you the problem that we're working on and we worked on all of yesterday, which was to live stream some 360 video. So that's the first thing we'll talk about. Then we're going to hear uh, case studies or conversation starters from artists in both cities uh, to hear what they're working on, what's exciting about that. And last, we're going to attempt to have a conversation between our two cities, between our room here in Kingston and uh, Ian's room in Prague and see if we can get a transnational conversation running. I, don't, I just need one more set of hands. And I also just want to mention that this, like so many of our conversations here at Folda, 
is uh, an experiment. We haven't done this before. And so this is my first time facilitating a conversation uh, over distance between two cities and things might go wrong. And speaking of things that might go wrong, that takes us right into our sharing our experiences from yesterday. And Ian, I wonder if you want to describe what we were working on yesterday. Yes. Uh, so what we were, what we wanted to do, we've been working a lot around mixed uh, reality and integrating VR with live performance to try and showcase how that, uh, the capabilities of that and some of the opportunities for that. One of our goals with this session was to do a bi-directional VR link-up in which we would stream uh, a immersive view of each place into the other place. Uh, we put a lot of effort into making sure we had adequate bandwidth, um, the appropriate equipment, uh, and uh, enough knowledge to know how to do it. Uh, and then we're extremely thwarted for a number of different reasons, which uh, uh, come up every so often. So that we're continuing to work on that, so that hopefully by the end of both events, which uh, culminate this weekend, that we'll be able to make that sort of link up. Uh, so we're continuing to work on that. Our goal was to be able to show you uh, a 3D uh, view and show you everybody in the room at the same time streaming through a VR headset uh, and likewise coming in the other direction. Uh, not to get too tucked into it uh, because everybody sort of threw uh, as much energy into it as I think was humanly possible. We were here up into the point at which we were getting pushed out of the space last night uh, trying to solve this. Uh, there are a variety of issues of trying to integrate technology like that, uh, trying to get that amount of uh, data go going from place to place, connecting to the appropriate stream. At some point, I think we've determined last, uh, last night that um, between a YouTube policy change and uh, their persnickety uh, streaming settings, that they decided that today they didn't like us. In other spaces, we've gotten it to work without an issue. Uh, so we wanted to, to proceed anyway to have this conversation about uh, 360 streaming VR content um, and how that gets integrated into various ways, even though that we didn't have that, uh, because that's sort of the experimental nature of integrating technology into our practice, is that um, oftentimes it doesn't work, and we figure it out. Maybe on our end, I could pass the mic over to Sophie Traub, who was uh, troubleshooting, attempting to set up the 360 camera to just go into detail about some of the roadblocks that we encountered. And before I do, Ian, I just want to say that the papers on your laptop are in, uh, we can hear them when they move against the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> or something. <laughs> Sophie! Thanks, Adrian. Uh, so yeah, to go very briefly into the persnickety details of what we were up against yesterday, um, we were working with a Yi 360 camera, which has recently um, released a, a camera that is set up to live stream, and there's a, an interface through the camera that you connect to through your phone to make that happen. Um, in order to connect to the Wi-Fi here, there wasn't an opportunity to use a username password, so we couldn't use the university's um, Wi-Fi connection, so we set up our own router and then we're working through um, an, our, our own Wi-Fi connection. And then uh, we're still coming up against roadblocks when we were trying to launch the live stream itself. And, um, uh, and Ian proposed that perhaps it's a new policy that YouTube um, introduced, that you need to have a thousand plus subscribers to, um, to live stream from a phone. And because the camera is linked through a phone, we were up against, um, so we thought that might be the possibility. And then uh, I worked with Martin at the end of the day because um, from the National Arts Center because they have 4,000 subscribers to their YouTube channel to try to um, launch the uh, live stream through their YouTube channel. And um, we were still up against roadblocks. So I have the camera, I have two Oculus. Um, throughout the festival, I'm going to aim at lunch breaks to sort of give it a try again. And if anyone has ideas about how to troubleshoot or has experience working with the Yi camera or doing um, live stream in 360, 
Um, I'm happy to, I'd love to learn from you, and um, I'm happy to give it a try again. And if, um, if Ian's able to get it set up on his end, we have the Oculus headsets and can, can look at um, what's going on in Prague from here. So if we're able to make the connection in either direction, um, the, or we, hopefully we will before the end of the festival, and I'll be continuing to work on that. And, and if I can add just a bit of detail, the re one of the reasons we have the Yi camera is usually it's our backup camera for doing live streams. So, the backup camera, that's cool. Maybe it's not the best backup camera. Apparently, it's, not, Apparently. it's, it's a good backup camera, it's not a good first choice. Because <laughs> hopefully you never have to use the backup. Okay, well, I think that we're going to move into our next section of our conversation, which is the conversation starters, and I'm going to hand that over to you, Ian. Yeah, so we have two people here. They're the people that you can see with me. I've got Dr. Andrew Sam. I, we talked about this yesterday. <laughs> I've known Andrew for Sam Pree. Sam Pree. It's funny. The <laughs> funny part about it is that Andrew and I have worked together for years now, and I and and uh, this has come up a number of times. Because uh, uh, whenever I think about how it's spelled, I'm getting it uh, wrong. And Beth Cates, who many I think in the room uh, know. Uh, we've asked each uh, on both sides to, to uh, talk a little bit about the work that they're doing. So I'm going to talk, uh, pass it over to Andrew uh, to start that over, and we'll do, uh, we'll pass it back and forth between our two locations. Yes. Okay. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi, Canada. Hi, Rob. Um, so let's see. So my name is again is Andrew Sempery. Uh Let's see. I'm um, I'm a researcher in digital sonography and uh, technologies for stage performance. I work mostly at a school in Western Switzerland called La Manufacture, um, and then I also uh, am a co-founder of a research lab, a private research lab called Place Lab, uh, where we build technologies for geolocative uh, data visualization um, and, uh, and that's, that sort of thing. Uh, and then lastly, I'm the head of engineering for Toaster Lab, which is an organization I work on with Ian. Uh, and in that context, we develop technologies further for augmented reality performance. So that's me. I don't know if you want me to go further now. Or... Yeah. Would you talk a little bit about what it means to create uh, geolocated mixed reality performance? Yeah, sure. Um, so there's a couple of different things here. There's, there's kind of a, a I started to talk about this a little bit earlier. But there's a technological component, and then there's kind of um, the social performance component. And I'm super interested in both of these. Um, so in the context of my research, I'm mostly interested in what does it mean to do this at all? Like, what does it actually mean to have a performance that's mediated across different time, but also space? What does it mean to, uh, to time shift storytelling, um, to change the sequences of things? Uh, and how is the audience different now than it used to be? Uh, what are the expectations? So there's a, a whole bag of questions, which I hope we can talk about. About, um, that, I'm, that I'm actually super interested in. Uh, and then in the context, especially of the Toaster Lab stuff, there's a bunch of technical problems that I think we're all familiar with, which is how do you actually build systems to do them? How do you actually create a geolocative AR experience? Uh, and uh, one of the problems that we've identified is that the expectation of both the audience and the people who produce it is generally higher than the tools that are available. So it's like, I really want to do this thing because I've seen it on my phone. Um, I don't really have the expertise, and so I kind of settle for halfway. And so concretely, what we're trying to do at Toaster Lab, um, among, I mean, we have specific projects, but kind of the broader picture that I'm interested in from the engineering standpoint is to try to create a set of tools which are more broadly available that will let us raise that foundation so that we can all collectively go from how do I do this thing to was that an interesting one or not? And so we can kind of move, move the experience up a bit. Um, so we're working on that, and we have, again, some specific projects that we can talk about, but we're trying to really build out an infrastructure to accelerate this process so that we can see a whole lot more of these in the world. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about one of those, uh, around one of the, the, the projects that we're working on right now? Can you talk a little bit about where we are in the middle of uh, what the project now known as Trail Off? Trail Off project. I, can't talk about it. I feel like I want to grab Adrian, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> we have we actually have the director of this project sitting in the room. I'm not going to put her on the spot, but I am now on the spot because I have to talk very nicely about this. <laughs> yeah. It's actually a lovely project. Um, so the Trail of Project is for the, the Philadelphia Park Commission. Did I get that right? Uh, Sorry, Pennsylvania Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania yeah, Environmental, Environmental, Environmental Council. Thank you. Um, and it's a project where uh, a, uh, it was a juried um, selection of authors who have written stories for specific trails, which are in Philadelphia. 
So on one level, the idea is that it's essentially an audio tour, that you'll go and you can listen to a tour as you walk the trail. Um, but I think that we're all super interested in injecting that with a lot more uh, subtle and not so subtle uh, interesting changes. So it's a lot more than sort of just the podcast. Um, the stories themselves, for example, are not, they're not your typical kind of trail narrative. Um, I don't want to speak for any of the authors, but they're all very different in, in wonderful ways. Um, and then the structure is also something that we're working on now, but we're trying to work on uh, getting the authors to write and adapt their stories to the structure of the trail as someone might walk it. Um, but we have all sorts of interesting questions about different types of mobility and how people are able to traverse the trails. Uh, what does it mean to be finished, for example, um, if, you, if you don't feel capable of being on the trail? Uh, what does it mean to revisit the trail? Um, so there's a whole like, kind of bag of super fascinating storytelling questions uh, that we're encountering. Um, and again, that uh, I'm splitting this two ways. So then there's also technical problems, which is uh, our technical issues that we have to figure out, which is, okay, we've got the story. Um, they've got some audio components, uh, which are voice, but we also have sound. Uh, we also have uh, perhaps music. We've got some ambient music. We've got cues. We've got the app to build. So how do we mix all of these pieces together? Um, so that gets a little bit to sort of what I was talking about earlier about the infrastructure. So we're also trying to build out a kind of offering infrastructure because this project itself is distributed. Um, I'm based in Switzerland, Ian's in Canada, the project is in Philadelphia, the authors are mostly in Philadelphia, all in Philadelphia? These guys are Philadelphia. Philadelphia region. So the trails, sorry, I'm repeating you because I think the mic is here. Um, uh, so the trails are, uh, yeah, are, are in Philadelphia. So we, we have a distributed team as well. So we've got a lot, a lot kind of on our plate. Um, I'm super excited about it. It's definitely a project where we're kind of inventing it literally as we go. So we're like, oh yeah, we need that. And we have to kind of build it. Yeah. Um, which is actually, again, a lot of, uh, of what I do. I generally sit, it's like a weird kind of position. I, I really like what you're talking about with digital property. It's something like that, but I also code at the same time. So it's like, um, I call it co-development, but it's like I literally sit with people who are developing the project and try to build the tools as, Thank you. Yeah. Um, who joins us from Kingston? Our, fir <clears throat> our first speaker here in Kingston is Gada Jane, and I'm going to ask Gada to introduce herself and tell us about your work. You have about 10 minutes. Hi, uh, I'm Gada Jane. I work with the University of Waterloo um, at the Games Institute, and I'm a research associate. And what I do as a research associate, essentially I started making projects with them, making interactives, and we started talking about virtual reality, and that moved into me basically talking to everybody that I could who works in virtual reality around the world, going to festivals, and building a network uh, internationally of creators and industry people and researchers and what we're that's been the first phase that we've done and now what we're moving into now is building collaborations and I have two roles essentially one of them is generally designing collaborations and working with um, researchers and creatives and industry to figure out what are the intersection points how can we find a way of working that actually genuinely gives you something that you're really interested in that is a problem for you. Um, so a lot of that is finding out who's in the network and then as assembling uh, in very kind of specific and tailored ways projects. My okay. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Now I can walk, that's nice. Um, so basically, I do this work of talking to people and finding out what they're interested in. And I think, uh, personally, that sort of underlines all, all the work I do. I also have a production company where I'm the creative director. It's called Velvet, Velvet Icons, and we're a new media production company. We work across forms. We're developing a web series. Uh, we're looking at co-producing a VR piece. And what brings together all my different work is really being interested in individuals and what they're genuinely interested in. I have this kind of deep personal aversion to people doing something that doesn't matter to them. And 
I think <laughs> that drives everything. So what I try to do when I'm developing the research projects is say, okay, what is actually going to be useful and interesting? And that you can explore maybe in a way, if you're working with the university, that you can't explore when you have a very strict production timeline or a very strict uh, product timeline. So what we can do is we can kind of talk about these problems that go a little bit deeper, that are a little bit um, maybe more open-ended or, or less um, directly for one specific project, because what we can't do is develop research projects that go really quickly. <laughs> we have us much slower timelines at the university, so that means we can open up these problems, set up conversations, and then develop projects where you're exploring them in kind of more careful and measured ways. So the way that I think about designing a project then is I find out who's involved or who should be involved, and then I figure out really carefully um, what do they actually want from this? What kind of research output is important? And then I try to design the project so it's almost built different research outputs, different ways of engaging are built into a production timeline. Um, and I find that's an important way to work because I, I, I have, <laughs> again, it's, it's almost a personal aversion to people coming in and saying, let's do something, but then they agree to it, but they're not talking about the same thing, so it ends up being not quite what anybody wants. That's like my, <laughs> the thing I hate most in the world. Um, and so that's one of the ways that I'm working at the Games Institute. And uh, the other way is my specific interest is coming from a writing and filmmaking background. I'm very interested in storytelling. So I come to VR and my initial interest in VR is how do you tell stories? Um, like how does it become a medium where creators are communicating through it to the audience? And so I, I really like to work with, I am here actually working on uh, the Thousand Island Playhouse residency and working with a playwright to with Nick, who's over there, uh, to kind of think through, okay, how do you as a creator want to think in this form? I think that one of the opportunities and interesting things in VR is, or any, I specifically am working in 360, but any new medium um, is, if you're coming from a form where you're familiar with it, you've grown up with theater, you've grown up with film, then you understand really how, say, a close-up works at an intuitive level. You have that connection, you have that understanding, you can almost figure out how, without even thinking of that step of translating from, I want people to feel this way about this character to a close-up, you just naturally visualize it. And I think there's a few steps when you're working in a new medium to take what it is you're imagining people feeling about this character or in this scene into how do you stage that and thinking about. So I like to work very systematically, but from that very personal perspective with people. Um, and so that, that goes to working with, uh, I've done a few workshops working with playwrights specifically thinking about, okay, how do we translate the way that you think into 360 space if it's not familiar to you? Um, and also, uh, doing some some more kind of concentrated, we're developing some more concentrated specific studies on thinking about the grammar of the medium. So the way that you have continuity editing in, in film and that allows you to create an illusion of uh, continuous space. Um, how do you direct attention? What are the tools? What are the things? And sort of uh, thinking about systematizing that and approaches to um, explaining that that can make it clear and can make it um, easily more easily accessible to actually work in that form. Um, I would say that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So Ian, um, that's our first speaker over here. Over back to you. Uh, uh, so uh, and this, this is gonna be one of our technical challenges is that uh, because of the, the test with sound before, uh, Beth joining us from another instance of, the, of uh, our chat, of our Zoom link, uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Beth Cates, and we're going to make sure that we don't create some intense feedback in the room. Take it away, Beth. Okay. This also means that I can, as Ian said, go, go rogue, and I can, at a point later in the conversation, take you into the blue hour and show you uh, the magic that's happening in the other part of the hockey arena, where it used to be cold. Um, uh, and we're linking up this way because apparently my voice doesn't work through other microphones, um, which is weird. So uh, I'm, I'm Beth Keats. I know a lot of you in that room, which is really exciting. And I was there 
with a lot of you last year, and now I'm here sweating in Prague. Um, I am a lighting set, mixed reality, and media designer uh, based in Calgary and Toronto and Blythe. Um, and I, uh, I've been doing this for a, a long time. I was an early adopter of a lot of digital technologies, and I'm right now um, in the middle of a master's degree at the University of Calgary, where I'm working in drama and computer science, and I'm looking at emerging technologies, so augmented reality or AR, virtual reality or VR, um, uh, machine learning, natural language processing, artificial intelligence of different kinds, and uh, what I like to call carbon reality, or the stuff that we're made of. Um, and, and I'm looking at the ways that those things intersect with, um, with performance and performance design and performance creation. And I'm also looking at it um, from the perspective as a, as a digital dramaturg, which is something that I've been working to define uh, over the last few years. Um, and that is, it's looking at the digital dramaturgy, the dramaturgy of the digital, the content, the method of delivery. I think even the dramaturgy of code would be something really interesting to think about. Um, and, and, the, and how it fits in then to the dramaturgy of performance. Uh, I'm the, the lead uh, creator of a, of a major digital strategy fund that is going to be announced more formally and more publicly with four new play development centers, which is then about, in, in a similar way to the previous speaker, looking with playwrights, but particularly with dramaturgs, and, and looking at the digital and dramaturgy and uh, expanding the vocabulary, opening up the vocabulary for um, people who work in more traditional ways, and, and how can we um, share all of the knowledge that, as we earlier called ourselves in our offline conversation, the unicorns that we've been connecting from different places, the people looking at performance and these emerging technologies, which is different than the gaming world, but bringing all that knowledge from the gaming world, um, and, uh, and seeing what, it, what does it mean? What does it mean as the technology changes on a weekly basis? You, you talked about your, I'm gonna talk loudly so we can hear you on your headset so I don't have to switch between. Uh, you talked a little bit about the, the Digital Lit project. Um, from a creative side, could you talk just a little bit about Barry the Wren? Uh, so, Barry the Wren, which is a really interesting lineage. Um, it's a project that I started at the University of Calgary. Um, it was a collaboration with the, the drama department and uh, the uh, Evolutionary Swarm Lab, which is the computer science lab that I'm a part of at the, at the university, uh, working under Christian Jacobs, uh, our professor. And Neil Christensen, uh, who's a student in the computer science side, um, uh, and I created this project that's turned into my thesis project but is continuing to have a life beyond it. And it was actually, for those of you who are, are Ontarians particularly, you'll know the Donnelly story. Um, and uh, a couple of years ago, Paul Thompson and Gil Garrett and I created a play about Robert Donnelly. And in that story, I discovered a woman whose voice had basically been erased from history. And I brought this, this woman and the one particular fact of her having exhumed her Donnelly husband's bones and encased them in a steel casket um, and yet was completely absent from the history. I brought that into the computer science lab and I said, let's look at this. And uh, Neil, who's, who is concerned about ideas of reality and breaking reality and what does reality mean anymore? Um, and I worked with an actor um, and using photogrammetry, which is the creation of 3D digital objects by photographing carbon real objects, um, using photogrammetry, virtual reality, augmented reality, pass-through cameras, uh, and live performance, created a piece where, a one-on-one -on -one performance piece where you got to, um, Annie got to finally tell her story directly to you and where we really played with the idea of the overused 
presence idea. So the presence of a human in a virtual world with you in a space that she wasn't present with you in, in in the virtual space, she was present with you in the carbon space, but you couldn't see her. Um, and 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 the ways that that gave us access to empathy and emotion and um, uh, uh, and a, an intimacy that um, we were playing with, and different ways of experiencing object too, um, uh, through both a virtual object and real objects, and playing with perception and. Um, and, and playing with how, like, how far into storytelling could we get? What, what story did these objects hold? And, and how could we use all of these really intimate um, methods of technology? How could we make the technology intimate and, and real? Uh, I'm going to mute myself. OK. All right. Good. All right, thank you, Beth. <laughs> um, Adrian, I'm going to turn it back to you for that side of the link up. Thank you, Ian. Uh, our last speaker here in Kingston is Janani Balisuvranian, and I'm going to hand you the I'm going to hand you the mic, and I'm going to get you to follow me out here. Hi, my name is Janani Balasubramanian. I was asked to tell you a little bit about my work and some of the questions that I'm thinking about in relation to it and in relation to augmented, virtual, mixed, whatever word we're using now, uh, reality. So uh, what I do, I'm a writer, <laughs> I make games, and I'm a performance creator based out in New York City. And I'm in residence at the Public Theater as well as the Department of Astrophysics at the Museum of Natural History. So a lot of my work is based in really deep collaboration with uh, who I consider the coolest scientists in the world, um, the, my astrophysicist friends at the museum and in a couple other parts of the United States. So what I try to do is use old-fashioned storytelling as well as games and play in concert with different kinds of new media, whatever makes sense with whatever story we're trying to tell from the universe. Um, so I use augmented virtual reality whenever it's appropriate, whenever it makes sense, to help bring the poetry and drama and the stories that are happening in the universe around us into the hands and minds of more audiences. So to invite people into the story of science and into the story of theater and to performance in a way also, uh, especially for audiences who have not seen themselves as part of the story of science or theater. Um, astrophysics in particular is this really rigorous discipline, right? To be an astrophysicist, uh, to be a modern astrophysicist, you have to be a mathematician and a physicist and a computer scientist and a data scientist, and crucially, also a storyteller. And because it's uh, ultimately the entire discipline of astrophysics is built on creating new and interesting ways of seeing, right? So they're taking what I consider an impossibly small amount of data. I think the equivalent to you would be like if I gave you a lock of hair but told you nothing about it um, and then asked you to write a bi biography of the person that that hair came from. That is what astrophysicists are doing with the amount of data that they're able to gather from the universe um, through different kinds of telescopes. Um, so there's a very human, exciting, um, storytelling component to the work that they do, and I am passionate about bringing that side of it to more audiences, especially people who have not had access to maybe the mathematics and physics that is required to go through the rigor of everyday astrophysics. Um, so one medium that I work in for a number of different projects is audio augmented reality. So I build projects where audience members gather in large and small spaces, some projects large, some projects more intimate. Uh, they're offered headphones, and through the headphones, they're given narrative instruction and music. And through that, they are animating the story of something one of my astrophysicist buddies is researching, right? Some really contemporary data research in astronomy. Um, we tend to focus on celestial objects that are unfamiliar to most people or celestial phenomena that we're just, you know, figuring out that most people don't know about, um, that we as humanity collectively barely know about. And what I try to create are these experiences where people are able to embody 
these celestial phenomena. So even without, again, going through all the mathematical rigor of it, you have uh, attained some embodiment of the physics itself. Uh, and in doing so, also opened up new kinds of social questions and new questions related to your own lives and the lives of the people around you, um, new metaphorical spaces that we can access by telling different kinds of stories about the sky and the universe. Um, I think I'm constantly inspired by how science itself as a discipline um, like theater also, but really science itself requires uh, many different kinds of scientists to be in the room to excavate different kinds of science. Um, I take a lot of heart in the fact that um, the scientists that I'm working with are, are looking at objects that uh, are literally invisible to our eyes, um, that exist in wavelengths outside of the optical, um, and are also thinking about movements of collective systems. And so for me, those are exciting metaphorical spaces to explore as a storyteller. Um, so I have three questions that are emerging for me in my work overall, and then specifically in these kinds of audio AR pieces. So one is how to, I think relevant to some things other folks have been talking about, how to both in a technological sense and in a dramaturgical sense, make those experiences responsive to audience movement, gesture, and collective movement. So again, we can actually faithfully embody what's happening in the sky, but it happens as an organic process. And you don't have to tell people every step of the way, now you're this and now you're a star in a co-moving group, but rather you kind of experience it as, some, as something that happens all around you. Um, a second question that I have is again, both a tech and a dramaturgical question is how to make uh, immersive experiences more broadly, but specifically the kinds of audio AR work that I focus on, uh, adaptive and accessible to disabled audience members, and to help that happen from the get-go so that accessibility doesn't become a matter of maybe slapping super titles on a piece or having interpretation after the fact, but becomes part and parcel of our compositional practice and kind of an interesting place to work from uh, rather than something that we consider a roadblock to look at, you know, after we've made the whole dang thing. Um, a third question that I'm thinking about, which I also want to use to talk about a specific project, is how to, uh, by combining these kinds of works that have storytelling references from multiple fields, for me that's uh, theater, astrophysics, and also literature, um, and how we can make works that live kind of like chameleons, like artistic chameleons, can live in theater contexts, can also live in educational contexts, can also live outside in somebody's backyard, um, and can also live inside a science museum, a science center. Um, so to that end, one project that I have been working on with an astrophysicist collaborator, is a piece called The Gift. So I'm working with Dr. Natalie Guznell, who's a stellar astrophysicist at Colorado College. And she researches the really special and intriguing lives of blue straggler stars. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about blue straggler stars. So um, I know you can't see the stars right now except the sun, which is also a star. Um, the stars have not gone away just because the blue sky is up. It's just when the sun is up, it um, dominates everything else around us. So the curtain has been pulled in a way, right? The sun is pulling our theater curtain for us. So if you were in a night sky, just imagine a night sky for a second. About half the dots that you see there, about half those stars you see are actually pairs of stars, are actually binary systems, right? But because they're so far away from us, our eyes can't resolve them optically as two different stars. Uh, which to me is a very exciting story in and of itself, right? That half of the things out there are actually both a star and its companion. Uh, they might be different in scale, one might be bigger or larger, uh, one might be one kind of star, one might be another, um, but there's these binary systems that are working very closely together, uh, that are often born together and co-move through the universe. 
So what Natalie does is a kind of storytelling of forensics and excavation of a particular kind of story of a particular kind of star uh, that I find really witchy and fascinating. Uh, so what she looks at are these blue stragglers, which are stars that are bluer, hotter, and appear younger than uh, they actually are. And one pathway through, yeah, interesting, um, same here. So the uh, one pathway through which these blue stragglers are created is through the process of mass transfer. Um, so some binary star systems are so close to one another that they actually move mass from one to the other. And so she looks at a blue straggler that is sitting alongside a white dwarf, which, as she says, is something like the stellar equivalent of a lump of coal. And she says, what happened there? And that's the story that together we're uh, animating through this piece. So the story of what happened there is that these stars were very close together. Uh, what has become the white dwarf used to be actually a red giant star, which is a phase that many stars enter towards the end of their lives. And they're kind of puffed up and red and giant. Um, and that star, through kind of this gravitational tipping that happens, starts sending its mass over to its friend, right? That process of the mass transfer happens over tens of millions of years, but if a star lived in your lifetime, it would happen in about five minutes. So imagine if your whole body was somehow transferred from you to your friend in about five minutes. Uh, that's what happens. That's what happens to these, these two companions. Um, so then that donor star becomes a white dwarf and is just sitting there uh, essentially having lost everything. And the other star becomes a blue straggler, which uh, has this infusion of mass and becomes bluer, hotter, and is kind of living its life fast and hard because uh, it's burning its fuel up really quickly. So we wanted to create a piece to animate these really fascinating, beautiful, lively stories. And um, I think undo some of the ways that stars have been dominated. Uh, the story of stars and what happens in the universe has been dominated by kind of very masculine uh, and warlike understanding of what outer space is. And there are a lot of other ways to understand outer space too. And so we... Uh, through a process of kind of iteration, like we came together, we made one piece that was just kind of a movement game. It was really fun. Um, it's really fun developing astro astronomical work in a city that has an open sky, which we do not have access to in New York City, so I try to get out of there, because we have too much light pollution when we make these, make these projects. And then um, the two of us came um, and played around at, uh, in some studios in New York City for a while, and we made, something that was kind of like half art, half science game, that was fun. And then we thought to ourselves, okay, but we wanna make something that actually is integrating uh, these, these forms, these fields, these disciplines. And so we came up with this piece called The Gift where the form we're using is, uh, melds basically a lot of my favorite things um, because I grew up as a nerdy, lonely child, and to me, the first type of augmented reality that I experienced was reading, was literature, right? Um, my own imagination, that to me is an augmentation of reality. And so we have this form where people are offered a book uh, as well as audio, and so the reading becomes uh, at once kind of private as well as social experience. And so they're asked to do things to move through space, to interact with uh, the book, the space, and one another, and in doing so, bring to life the story of this star and its companion, um, and hopefully, you know, build some other little companionships along the way. Um, so that piece is in process right now. I think our, our next stage is figuring out what are, again, some of the kind of interesting dramaturgical things that can happen um, with the interactions between audience members and the technology we're using to uh, employ it um, in concert with these very old-fashioned, uh, simple techniques of theater. Um, so I think in the spirit of our community agreements, I'm just gonna say that's the end of what I have to say. Thank you. 
So now we're going to move into some uh, responses and questions now. And we're going to start with a question. It's going to be a little bit like a game of tennis. That's how we envision it. So we have a bunch of balls in the air. And then Prague is going to hit something over here. And then we're going to respond with an answer. And then, so maybe what I'll do is I would like to ask Gada and Janani to bring your chairs up here. And then that'll reduce our travel time. And Ian, I'm going to yeah. ask you to, to start our, our volley, our question and answer volley. Yeah, and I, I'm actually grateful that you, you brought both of the artists together, because that's sort of this question I want to open up to both of you. Um, we, had a, we had a conversation before the session earlier today. We're six hours ahead. So we had a bit of time to chat earlier with a number of other collaborators as well working and interested in this intersection of technology and live performance, both within uh, what we do and outside of it. Um, so ex expansive practices. And uh, a big topic that came up is what are the frameworks in which that work is able to happen? Uh, a lot of us, but not all of us, are tied to universities in different ways. Uh, we find funding in different ways. We attach to institutions in different ways. Um, and I'm curious. Uh, how, uh, and, and you both talked about multiple, uh, a multitude of ways in which uh, your, your work gets created. Um, and so the question there is, if you can sort of uh, talk a little bit about the, the, the challenges of working within effectively a discipline that doesn't necessarily have a, 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 a clear delineation. We're talking about performance, we're talking about astronomy, we're talking about AI, we're talking about computer science, we're talking about being very fluid between these areas. And uh, I wanted to ask you about how you experience that fluidity in executing your projects. Um, so you mean in the structuring of the projects or in actually working through the projects or both? Yeah. Well, the, the initial question is the structuring of the projects and, and, and how that works together. You talked a little bit about it, but then also how that impacts ultimately the work that is generated out of that. Uh, I, I guess the biggest way that I think that impacts what I do is it, I try to think about that a lot at the beginning of a project um, and be very clear about how the different people are going to be thinking. Like I, I think there's a sort of initial framing stage where I would not just think about um, what are the things that are going to be done, but who are the people that are going to do them and how are they talking to, how are, how, what languages are they using, how are they going to, uh, and so it's almost like a get to know you period where I'm trying to find out um, what what do I need to know about their domain to actually be able to speak? And I do a, sometimes a kind of translation role. I think it's a lot in designing. For me, my approach is very much in f working with individuals and then spending a lot of time at the beginning figuring out what is the specific structure of this project and what do we want from it? I think that one of the things that I'm very interested in is visualizing um, an end that has like multiple outcomes that are personalized. I think this the relationship between what is interesting to people and how do you actually have a process where people are actually getting to engage with the thing that is interesting to them as opposed to a sort of morphed version of it is probably the most interesting piece of that for me. So I think there's the language, there's how do you how are people going to communicate um, at what like points in the structure of the project are they going to be able to communicate? And these are all design questions, essentially. Um, is that, I, th I feel like I missed something key in your question, though. Not, I, don't, I don't think so. I mean, okay. yeah. No, I think that's excellent. Thank you. I think, for me, the most valuable way to think about structuring these collaborations is thinking about uh, actually is a metaphor that also again comes to me from astronomy. So a way that a lot of celestial objects, stars and otherwise form is in these molecular gas clouds uh, where something triggers some action and the gas eventually accretes into various types of celestial objects um, in these gas clouds that are also called stellar nurseries, you know, 
these birthing grounds for these new objects. Um, so for me, what that means is I have really appreciated being able to spend a great deal of time with the people that I collaborate with, not always working on a project. So when I hang out with my astronomy research group in New York, um, I go to the meetings, I hang out with them, I spend time with them one-on-one, -on -one, um, not always with a project goal. Sometimes we're working on something specific, but to me that time of uh, building fluency and ease with each other's practices, vocabularies, uh, what my scientists' friends are thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis that is just about their own lives. Also, the cycles of, that their work goes through, the roadblocks that they're hitting, that stuff to me has been just as valuable as the time uh, that I have spent um, maybe just hearing one of them talk or reading one of their new papers. Um, one of my frustrations in how a lot of art science collaborations are imagined, maybe institutionally, is people think that if we hang out for a couple hours that something cool will come of it. Um, and I actually think we need so much more time together um, because without it, that's what leads to like bad science in art. Um, and bad science metaphors, especially in art. Um, but when we have the time together, um, there's some really wonderful things that open up. Like for me, it has been a great opportunity to learn from scientific research practices for my own work. Um, I've also really enjoyed seeing members of my research group in New York get excited about their own creative impulses and access those in you know events that we've put together or co-created in different spaces. Um, so I guess part of structuring the collaboration um, across, structuring collaborations across fields for me is thinking about that um, balance of informal and formal work uh, and also times that you hang out without working. Thank you. Um, I, I, oh, question oh, for us. I do have a question for you. It's like you were reading the same script or something. I know. Uh, <laughs> I stopped wrestling it on the mic. I can't help but think when I'm listening, uh, because I think I'm the, maybe the only person uh, in the six of us who's not affiliated with a university, unless you want to call it the University of Mom. Um, so I, I can't help but thinking, um, I have two young kids, four and six years old, and I spend a lot of time thinking about um, uh, uh, their development and how do I share large ideas with them in a way that they can understand, right? So, so I was thinking about my audience when I'm talking about, I don't know, why is the sky blue? That classic question or, or uh, <laughs> what are those things in the women's washroom that you pay 25 cents for? Which is always a fun ex uh, exclamation to do. Um, but when I was listening to you speak today, I was thinking, who, who are the audiences for your works, Beth and Andrew, and, and how are they, are you seeing patterns in terms of the socioeconomic, maybe socioeconomics of demographics of where those audiences are coming from? And do those audience patterns match where you imagine your, or where you want or desire your work to be landing. Because uh, I, I can't help thinking about who gets access to the technology and the equipment and the work and who doesn't. And so I guess that's the question behind my question and what are the strategies that you're using or the thinking that you're using to, to broaden that reach? <laughs> Just a Better little answer. question. Yeah. Do you, uh, Let's go and you want to jump in first? Okay, yeah. Okay, there we go. Um, I was actually just telling Andrew a story about this. So we, Neil and I, um, co-created Buried Around, uh, we did a, a sort of table presentation of, of the project uh, at the Computer Science Showcase at the university a, a couple of months ago. Where we just, we just we had the pictures and then it was us trying to give our like 
it's the elevator pitch, but it's the elevator if it was in the Empire State Building because the project's so complicated. Um, but we were talking to a group of, of young people. Um, I would sort of loosely say like 18 to 22. And we're talking about a story, this is an old story in history. And, and when we sort of went through everything, one of the, one of the guys turned to me and he said, oh my God, I would totally pay to see that. Um, and that was a really interesting experience. Um, like, okay, so we're making something that, that young people want to engage with. We got the same feedback from from the the pretty like is pretty homogenous demographic um, in when we actually performed the piece. Um, but I would say, to there's a democratization of the technology coming, um, and so the, it will be more accessible. It it got more accessible a couple of weeks ago. It's going to get more and more accessible. Um, and I, I think, you know, it's part of, part of using university resources too to sort of bring the projects out into the wider world where they're being subsidized by multiple different places. And that's where these relationships and these living with scientists and working with different places starts to become really valuable, I think, for the, for the wider population. Uh, and, it, and it's going to start really small, like I was talking to someone the other day about, like, how do we do this for a larger audience? And it's going to start piecemeal. It's going to start thinking about doing it in different ways. It's part of our audience, actually, in an Oculus, and part of the, part of the audience is it's only 10 people show get to see it. But we find a way to, to I don't know, subsidize it. There are, like, there are also companies like, you know, Unreal that are offering giant mega grants to think about this technology in a different way. So I don't have an answer. It's a huge question. It's definitely a problem as I sit here with a thousand dollar phone and 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 know that not everybody has access to that. Um, but I, but we're also seeing it get more affordable. So hopefully that keeps going. Oh right. Okay, we're gonna hand over. Uh, I mean, this is a big topic that we that we've talked about on our project. So, yeah. yeah. So, so, I mean, I, I adore this question, and it's also um, I, all I can really offer is some more trouble, I guess. Um, getting to tell a story is an incredibly privileged position, um, no matter where you are at. But being the person who's on the stage, who has the mic, um, and who gets to speak, is is an incredible weight. Um, and I think when we're working with technology, especially, we have to be super careful about what it is that we're amplifying, um, especially because a lot of what we talk about when we talk about technology comes uh, out of a particular development cycle, which doesn't observe uh, any real ethics, honestly, right? I mean, it's sort of like, it's, it's the spearheaded front of, of a capitalist system that just produces what sells really well. And then we pretend often that it's neutral and we can use it as grounds for storytelling, but it's not neutral in the slightest. Um, so there's so much here. I mean, there's so much here to unpack about where where we stand and what we get to use and what we amplify. And I think just being really careful about that is is incredibly important. Um, I mean, for me personally, one of the things that's that's both uh, part of the problem, but also I think a little glimmer of the solution. I'm I'm uh, so I'll, I'm 42 ish. Uh, I guess I'm sure forgetting how old I am. I'm 42. I'm Generation X. I grew up on the internet. This is the point of the story. I literally grew up on the internet. Um, right, so as a nerdy child myself, this was before anybody knew what the web was because it didn't exist. It was before the internet was a thing. It was like you're a computer nerd. And that meant that you didn't go outside, you didn't have many friends. But the thing was that I had a lot of friends. I had a lot of international friends. I had a lot of people who were discussing some really interesting stuff that I wasn't seeing in other places. And I know that this is true for a generation of folks and continues to be true for marginalized communities. I mean, mainstream as well. But if you look at what is working in social networks, Right? You're seeing um, amazing things happening in the queer community. You're seeing amazing things happening in black communities. It's not perfect. But my question now is, where do we take this? So this is really like a very deeply personal struggle for me. Um, again, I grew up on the internet. I worked for a long time in social media research for a big tech company. Um, and the, the myth that we all had was that this was going to be this great democratizing force. And that's not the political moment that we find ourselves in at all. Um, but as storytellers, can we, uh, can we counter that? 
Can we amplify additional stories, other stories? Can we bring different voices to the table? And I have to believe that we can, otherwise I wouldn't be involved in arts or theater. Um, there has to be a way to do that. So I, yeah, I mean, there's a few projects that I have in mind that I have come Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't know, I'm just gonna kinda, so this is the part where we're gonna start the questions rolling. So I have a follow-up question. Um, because uh, to take advantage of my privilege of holding the mic, which is um, you talked about who, who you invite to the table and, and being mindful about that. So if you have projects where you're, where you're doing that, I'd love to hear examples of, of who you're inviting to the table and how, how that's addressing these questions. Can you talk about that? Do you want me, you want me to talk about grammars? Okay. Uh, Andrew's, Andrew's deferring to me because we've been working on a project for a while uh, called Groundworks, uh, which is in collaboration uh, primarily with a, a dance company called Dancing Earth, which is uh, run by Rulon uh, Tagen, who is uh, it's essentially a pan-indigenous dance company. So there's a lot of different populations that come in there. Um, the genesis of that project from their side is that there have been a number of collaborators that are working primarily in Northern California, a number of collaborators from local indigenous communities who had been contributing to the work and it was, let's spend a year turning that around. So it was a give back period. So uh, part of that meant spending lots of time embedded with a number of communities surrounding the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, they had already intended to do that project when, uh, because we were developing things and Rilan is also uh, known in, in uh, an ecological performance circles, uh, and that's where a lot of my practice has been um, and work has been. I reached out saying, uh, we have this work in which we are looking at doing a lots of site environmental work. Uh, is it something that's interesting to you? And as it turned out that a number of our collaborators were saying like, what we really want to do is instead of bringing things onto stages where we're bringing things in, we want to see how we can bring people out to the places where we are. Um, but, you know, as, a, as sort of a, a highlight of the, this the question of access, um, uh, there is one of the communities that we're working with is a Point Arena uh, Manchester Band of Homo Indians. Uh, and their reservation is the, the calling it large is, is generous, it's a few thousand people. Uh, the reservation itself is a few hundred people, uh, but it is the, the largest like town, like infrastructure near the Manchester cable station, which is where the internet comes from Japan to come to North America. And it's where Hawaii connects. So you have uh, this cable station that is the connection of the backbone, and then you've got a community that up until half a decade ago um, didn't have consistent broadband access themselves. The area is still really underserved, and part of that is like there's not a lot of market demand, and a lot of it switched to mobile, and you sort of have to drive half an hour to get to a proper signal. And so in working with this community, there's a lot of those, those questions um, in building uh, the application that we're now building. We've been developing content that's an immer immersive content, video, audio, um, other things that are experienced that end up being geolocated. But then the question then becomes like, the priority for who can access this is that community. So if, they, if we don't have strong Wi-Fi signals, if we don't even have 4G service out there, how do we deliver what are very data-hungry experiences? Um, and how do we work with technology that is otherwise expensive, becoming more affordable? Um, but then uh, the, the big technical question that we've been battling across a number of different projects is how do we make things uh, accessible with the devices that people have? How do we meet people where they are with the experiences um, so that we can have this dialogue as opposed to making it something that is locked off to somebody who can afford a new headset, someone who can afford to refresh their phone every two or three years, uh, and all those different factors that sort of, uh, in, in a version of mainstream, is an expectation uh, that you will have something relatively current. Um, so that's sort of one example about how that's manifest. Um, and that's manifesting in, OK, this code needs to run across different platforms. Uh, that's more difficult to develop than de developing off of one. Developing something for just uh, Apple um, would be easier. 
um, trying to make it as web oriented as possible, um, trying to keep the data minimized, uh, all of those different infrastructural questions uh, become implicit and then start to shape the work as well. You start to change the shape of the work uh, because of the person who you want to access and it can't for simple technical reasons, um, you're doing something wrong. Thank you. Do we, um, do we want to open it up to questions f from our rooms now? Uh, I think maybe our, I've asked our artists here on this end to listen carefully as, you're, as our colleagues are speaking. Do you have any questions for our friends in Prague? Mm. Or vice versa, Prague to Kingston, about the work that was? I'm scanning the room. You're scanning the room where the brains are melting. <laughs> they are melting, and it is towards the end of our day. <laughs> but we have one, yes, we have we have one over here. Um, we have, uh, yeah, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna take advantage of the limits of our technology. Just watch. My, my question's for sort of all the presenters, and it's kind of a technical one. If someone was interested in getting into starting to work with or, or experiment with these uh, new with this new media, is there equipment or, or technical resources that you would recommend accessing, I guess? Do we want to start over here? For someone starting to work in, in like VR and AR, do you mean? In mixed reality, is there are there equipment or resources that you would recommend that they start with? Um, it, or, it, wait, or, yeah. or, or sound specific uh, experience, basically um, all just in general, like what I guess what are your tools that you're using, um, and then if, if you know of other tools that would be more accessible than an entry level without higher funding, um, that would be something that. Um, I guess my answer would be it really depends on what your interest is. If you are interested in 360 storytelling, I would say getting a very simple 360 camera and playing with it with people in the space is a really good place to start. If you're interested in um, virtual spaces, like you can, it really depends on what you're interested in doing and in what, like just starting working in Unreal or Unity is a great place for people, uh, for some people, but it, um, I would say get, actually starting with figuring out why you're interested in the technology and what you would like to do with it and then finding your most basic way to take you to the thing that you're genuinely interested in would be the thing I would start with. Um, because if you start with a technology that is actually not going to apply to where your interest is, then it's going to not help you at all. You'll end up playing with a small camera, but your real interest is in sound or how directional sound works and that's going to just take you further and further away so yeah uh, I'm going to offer uh, something and this is uh, this is this is a plug that's <laughs> only going to work for people on this side but in about 20 minutes uh, we just pull there's a workshop that just culminated here um, that was about doing a couple of days of using with introductory tools such as uh, some basic uh, 360 like easy to use cameras even those and working with them are things that you can orient with your phone. A lot of the tech, uh, a lot of uh, the thinking around it actually becomes much more. Uh, it's more about wrapping your head about what that content is actually doing. Many of the tools outside of like specialized cameras or perhaps specialized mics are actually then end up being the same. So uh, in this workshop, they were just doing like the the video editing tools that we were using to edit 360 content at this point are the same ones that anybody would be using to do other content. And because of the way that these things have been stored, especially on the consumer level uh, of those types of files, that you could actually pretty much use anything. And now YouTube and Vimeo have gotten smart about how to distribute those. So for one of the projects that we've been doing, that we launched on Monday, uh, uh, because it was something that we didn't want someone to have to download something, it's all web-based, it's geolocated, but then it just you, uh, exploits bouncing over to YouTube which builds a lot of the uh, like, ability to explore into the phone. There's a little bit of navigational tricks in there, but you'd be surprised what's there. Um, from a sound perspective, I might turn it this way. Yeah. And I will say as it's moving, as the mic is moving over there, 
um, that because we do have that workshop in about 20 minutes, that we have we have about five minutes left in our room. Okay. Oh, are we being there? Hi, I'm Bobby, I'm a sound designer uh, from New York. Um, so there's a few, I mean, kind of jumping on this question of like affordable entry points, especially 360 audio or 3D audio. Um, Zoom makes a really cheap recorder now. I think it's H2N that can do, I think it has four capsules and it can mm -hmm. do, uh, capture kind of simple ambisonic um, sound, which kind of means sound in multiple directions. Also, there's a, uh, if, if anyone programs in Max, um, which you have to have a Max license, there's a really fantastic software suite called SPAT made at EarCam that for a long time cost money and about a month ago they finally decided to just make it free. So it's a free tool that allows you to do really advanced spatial audio mixing. It's SPAT, S-P-A-T. Um, and that's kind of what a lot of the really fancy stuff is based on. Um, so it's kind of a great way to get started on that. And hopefully, I think at some point, maybe there'll be a, a pure data version. Um, there's also other free tools. Super Collider is an open source um, audio script-based uh, software that can also do spatial audio. So I think you know there's a lot of communities um, doing spatial audio, and that's kind of blowing up right now because of VR and AR. So it's kind of a great time. But I would say um, get a max license and start messing around. And um, I think if not that, then pure data. Thank you. Before um, we lose our connection with the phone. Can I, can can I, I respond now? really quickly? Or is there time for me? No, I was just going to pass it over to you. We have got one comment here before we lose you in Prague. Hi, this is Whit McLaughlin. Hello, Adrian. It's nice seeing you across time and space. Um, <laughs> I, I, I have a, a very uh, quick uh, response to where to start. I'm really beguiled by uh, the, uh, the uh, emphasis on metaphor that you brought to your conversation. Media just delivers metaphor. Uh, one time we were doing a project that we thought was going to be very sophisticated and our sponsors made us think down and down and down to flip phones. If it couldn't go through a cellular phone, we weren't going to do it. And it made us essentialize our content and we actually delivered a more interesting uh, metaphoric uh, media-based content through cellular phones than we would have if we had gone through smartphones, whether we had gone into sophisticated software uh, development. And so I just want to emphasize that metaphor is what media is all about. Thanks. Thank you. I love that. I do love we're that. all just nodding. Sorry. Yeah, we're... We, um, there's a, the, there's a including the, the proliferation of using the phrase carbon reality, as opposed to any other poor metaphor for real space. Um, the other thing that's come up a lot is the idea of affect over effects. Um, and that's, that's, that's where we're sort of like landing on our t-shirt phrase on this side. So Ian, am I right in understanding that, that you want out of that room or that you have to go to another workshop? Oh, uh, we are, we are we are scheduled to be out of this room. Well, I if I remember the script correctly, I was going to give you the last word here. <laughs> uh, you just took it away by by talking after I said affects over effects. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that was amazing. Last words, affect over effects. I saw. <laughs> it was very effective. It was so effective, I didn't notice it happened. Um, <laughs> I want to thank you both. I want to thank all three of uh, the three of you who are on our screen right now, but also the wider circle that's in the room with you down there in that hot, hot, hot uh, <laughs> room in Prague uh, for joining us and for, for uh, doing this experiment with us, as well as thanking our guests here. We can continue our conversation a little bit more um, if there are still questions in our room. 
And I, I mean, I'm going to talk into the computer. Um, and I would also offer, like, I'll throw my contact information up on the Slack, um, which I know is being used as the primary platform. Um, and I'm sure our colleagues will, too, because why not check another platform? Um, but I'm happy to engage with anybody um, as we delve into this murky, murky world. Yes. Thank you. See. Thank you. So this is the part of the script where Ian's supposed to say, "I'm going to end the Zoom now." <laughs> I, we just kept just keep stepping over each other's lines. No, I know. Uh, I know. Um, so this is the part where we're going to end the Zoom now. Thanks from this side as well um, for um, uh, uh, working through our uh, our sweaty hockey dreams here <laughs> at the PQ. <laughs> well, that was fun. We have some time left. We have about 10 minutes left. We can certainly wrap up early if we want to, but I wonder if there are questions inside the space for Janani or Gada. Yeah. Will you say your name again? Yes. What is it? Ghana. Ghana? OK. Um, I'm curious about this idea of um, industry, artist, collaboration, and the idea of um, people enjoying their work together. And I'm curious if you could just talk more about what those frictions might be that you're specifically trying to get at or address in terms of those relationships. Um, sure. Uh, you mean the frictions in people working together, or just like or maybe what? Maybe specifically how do you industry and industry artist collaboration. So usually there's a research element involved in what I do because it's with the university. But um, I, uh, so one of the things that happens when people, when industry and uh, researchers and, and sometimes with artists come together is that you have specific things that you, researchers tend to have very specific things they're interested in and that they're working on. And industry often will have very like clear problems. Um, and this is true also with artists, they have a specific, I, th I feel like artists are most likely to get lost in this process because they're often the ones that aren't anchored to some institutional structure. Um, and, but you get these, this sort of, we need to research this piece and you have something that's vaguely relevant and there's some kind of uh, monetized structure that gives you an incentive to work together. So you sort of make up a compromise where it's like, well, we'll work on this thing and then we can actually sort of make something. And it really depends on the, the structure. We try to do different research. So, so sometimes when it's industry, it'll be actually like bringing a student on to work on a project that is basically paid for, for four months. And then that has a very clear structure. It's more the kind of longer collaborations where you're building a project that's co-funded by different um, groups. And then you end up having these conversations where you sort of use the same words and assume you're talking about the same things, but you actually, the researchers really want to work on these specific problems and the industry maybe has a specific set of uh, things they need to happen right now and so I think when you rush those conversations you don't get to you get to maybe a compromised interest or a thing that can be like this is within our research group so we can make something happen or with on on the side with artists you build something that is basically coming out of your initial conversation. So you have an initial conversation where people are saying, okay, well, we're interested in, uh, recently we're starting a project um, w in collaboration with a group at Concordia, and there's a lot of uh, interest in accessibility of VR, and then there's some interest in specific uh, sound questions, and I think the there can be an uh, uh, inclination to immediately sort of put those things together into a project and then shape it around what people initially said, instead of kind of taking the time to say, okay, well, what is it specifically about accessibility, and how can that be built, or at what stages in the project is that a relevant question, and how can we kind of open up, explore that 
that question a little bit deeper and what we can do with that question and then see how that links to this other piece. So some of it is keeping questions separate and keeping people's interests separate for a while and letting them actually kind of develop and get clear. And I think this goes to what you're saying about actually spending time to figure out w what we want to do and where the value is going to be rather than um, saying things and then because, and I don't know if this is true in other places, but I feel like in Canada we do a lot of agreeing where we go to meetings and then we all agree and we've really had a good meeting because we've agreed to everything, but we've agreed to a bunch of stuff that we don't necessarily, like we did it for the sake of agreeing. And I think that's a really bad place to start a project. It's better to um, get our agreeing out of the way, then figure out what we actually want to do. <laughs> and then design the project from there. So really like build out that sort of process. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, as I'm Wojtek. Happy to be here with you all. Um, as a VR producer, I have this issue of uh, project management. And uh, most of um, my team uh, have different visions of the project. And uh, we start from something completely different than the project in the end. And um, do you have any specific tools for um, like in the creative process so that everybody is on the same page? Uh, yes, <laughs> I would say. Um, so structuring the project so that you know people's responsibility really well and, but starting from a point where you find out what people actually want to be doing and then give them and what is what are they going to be really good at doing, what are they bringing to the project, and structuring the project so that it lets them do the things that are important and valuable to them, and structuring the project around complementary skill sets is really helpful. But then also, I think that it's useful to know what vision in what places has authority in the project. So for example, it, and it's different depending on the project. If you're working, if I'm working on a piece and I'm consulting with a director, um, then I'm going to re respect that, that director's vision in a certain way. And I think that knowing sort of getting, like there's a sort of investment in, in it's not necessarily an authority structure, but in a, we understand that this person is doing this sort of bringing the pieces together and trusting in that um, is really valuable. And that's partly creating a story that actually has a space for the things that the different people on the team are doing. And I think it's really important to do that initial piece of finding out what are the, other, what are the individual people going to bring to the project and what, is it, what matters to them so that the person or people that are responsible for, for bringing those pieces together can constantly uh, reflect back the individual contribution. So it's kind of like a structure. Is that make sense? Does that help? It's there. Yeah. Hi. My question is for Janani. Um, is that how I? Is that how you? Janani. Name is sorry. Janani. Janani. Um, my name is Alex. I was so fascinated with your um, presentation and I'm, I just wonder if you could speak a little bit more about the way that the public engages with your work and if um, how they engage is part of your artistic process. Uh, you mean when people come to experience a work, what it actually looks and feels like? Uh, y y sorry, I couldn't hear the what. So w when people actually experience a work, how what it looks and feels like, is that what you're getting at? Y yeah, and you know, what the technologies you use, and yes, and is it a collective experience? Is it a solo experience? And, and whether or not that is something that you make part of your artistic decision making? Yeah, totally. I have a number of different kinds of projects right now that live in different ways in terms of whether they're collective or... Uh, large scale, small scale, or individual experiences. So it's a yes to all of those things, and that becomes part of how the project is mapped and, and developed and created. Um, I think uh, when we were talking before about you know what technologies one might need access to to start working on a new media project, for me, actually, um, I try to 
test things out as much as possible in the cheap way, both in terms of money and time investment, uh, before going to the expensive way. Um, both because it's harder to you know, turn the boat around uh, once you've put in the heavy capital and time investment on our project. Um, and then you also get to just make a lot of versions of the thing. Um, so I'm getting at kind of the what technologies um, we use, right? So for prototypes, for tests of things, it might be as simple as asking people to bring their own phones or sticking a Bluetooth speaker in the middle of the room and no, that's not gonna get us the crispest audio that we're ever going to use, but it'll get at the um, some of the questions that we're maybe trying to test. Um, if we're going to make like a beautiful handmade object eventually, we'll make something out of kind of post-it notes and string first. So that to me is also a technology that we use to, to test stuff. Um, in terms of implementing some of these audio pieces, um, we I've worked with uh, radio headphones that do broadcast historically for some pieces. Uh, right now I'm in the process of developing new software um, that can work with the what is up and coming in augmented reality audio to deploy the pieces. But I think a question that's on my mind that was also echoed across this is uh, how to make a piece that maybe, or how to develop that in a way that there may be A, B, and C versions in terms of cost. Uh, so that if there are institutions that are able to underwrite the cost of kind of the Rolls Royce version of the piece, fantastic, and that can happen. Uh, what are also other modes of implementing the piece for communities and uh, places that are not gonna have that kind of budget? Um, so that there are ways of um, scaling the cost up and down while still retaining the artistic heart of the piece. Um, in terms of what it actually looks like, so some of my works, people gather in a public space, um, whether that's indoors or outdoors, depending on the piece. Um, they're off, in a couple pieces, they're offered headphones and, and everybody is wearing a set. Um, and they're listening to things that um, offer them things to do, kind of mini games to play, uh, narrative that they experience and, and original music. Um, and the ways they move through the space, the way they interact with the audio, with one another, um, and kind of the macro patterns that are created by their interactions, um, each convey something. Like they, this relationship between the person and the audio is one relationship. The interactions between small groups of people is one relationship, and then the um, macro pattern is, an, is another relationship, which it is actually kind of faithful to how the physics works, too. Right, the, the way that the objects and um, particles are, are moving uh, follows that pattern, that there are simple rules that govern the small and large scales. So that's what I'm thinking about when I develop the pieces. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Gada. Thank you, all of you here in the room. Before I leave, I, there's a couple announcements. First of all, I wanted to say that it is quite cold in here and we've got, I know we're all shivering. Um, so we are on, working on that to see if we can make a change in the temperature settings in this side of this room. Um, that is happening. There's also the electric company Theater VR works that's, uh, that there are still slots available. If you want to catch that, check it out. Uh, the, you can find the spaces in the Slack channel and sign up at Mariah is your contact there. And then I wondered if Jamie is around. There you are. If you're, I was blinded by my own presence. Yeah, so we have a few folks who we um, didn't get introduced this morning, and I want to just make space for that to happen. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jax. I'm the communications manager at HowlRound. Um, it's really great to be here. Um, I'm also really excited about embodiment. Um, and so I'm curious about how technology can aid embodiment. Um, I'm very tired right now. <laughs> um, and I think it's important to have this conversation because it's happening whether we're in it or not. And so it's better that we're in it. Thanks. Next, we're going to have Stokely. So Dylan, if you can be on that camera, great. No, 
pressure. Hi, uh, my name is Stokely. I use the pronouns they and them. I'm the associate producer at HowlRound. Um, to answer some of the earlier questions, um, I'm really uh, excited right now about the brilliance and resilience of queer and trans people of color. So I often think about us in, the, in these conversations. And um, one word uh, was world making. And last but not least, I'm going to run over here to, oh, Dylan's got it. Great. I'm not going to run. Dylan. Hello. My name is Dylan Iruegas. My pronouns are he and him. I am the newish fellow of HowlRound. Um, so I was invited and said yes because I had to. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I'm actually like really excited because um, uh, digital and performance is something that I am always interested in creating within my own work as an actor, director, and writer. Um, and it is still kind of new to me because I do a lot of like DIY stuff. So it's like, uh, what can I do? Um, what was the other question? I think of integration and accessibility. So yeah. Great, thank you. And is there anyone else at this point who hasn't had the opportunity to introduce themselves to the room? I'd love to make that space now. Please make yourself known. Ah, yes. Hi. Behind you. Hi. Hi, I'm Jill Kiley. Whoa, sorry. Hi, I'm Jill Kiley. I'm with the National Arts Center. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, our, our team is sneakily setting up lunch over to my left at the bar, uh, at the bar space there, and we're taking an hour for lunch. This space is available for us to hang out in, as well as this lovely outdoor space uh, and the grass. Thank you, everybody, so far for the morning. <laughs>